Education US National Gathering. And a big thank you, heartfelt thank you to you, Sean, for joining us from the UK. And just an aside, you might have seen that wonderful book. Well, I hope you all have picked it up by now, Surviving the Future, edited by Sean Chamberlain. And it's because of it's because of Sean that that book is available to all of us. So um, now, Sean, when 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 I'm speaking this way, Sean's not hearing your audience participation. So the best way for Sean to know your excitement is some gesturing. So please, <laughs> so please do that as often as you would like. <laughs> um, so today's topic is Transitions Wider Vision, David Fleming and Surviving the Future. And Sean hosts a number of conversations on transitions engagement with greater, the, you know, a lot of the great challenges of our times. He also edited Transition Timeline. I mean, excuse me, wrote <laughs> Transition Timeline. He's an author, he's a writer, and I'm sure you're going to tell us the other good things that you're up to shortly. Um, Sean's been involved with the Transition Network since the since its inception. He's co-founder of Transition Town Kingston and author of the movement's second book, which I just mentioned, Transition Timeline. He's managing director of the Fleming Policy Center, former chair of the Ecological Land Cooperative, has spoken at venues um, from occupied camps to parliaments. In exploring the cultural narratives charting society's course forward, he's written for or edited a diverse range of books, magazines, academic journals, and other publications. Basically, this guy is a prolific writer. And um, he's also co authoring a UK all party parla parliamentary report with his close friend and regular collaborator, David Fleming. And his website, is darkoptimism.org. So lots of good stuff on that too. So that's who is joining us today. Most happy to welcome you, Sean. And so now we're gonna do this little toggle back and forth where we mute ourselves. Hello, can you all hear me over there? Yeah, great. So good morning all, or good afternoon if you're uh, in England, which obviously not. Um, so I'm hopeful that uh, I, I've, I've been able to listen to two of the three keynotes, um, Richard Heinberg's and Rob Hopkins. I didn't stay up quite late enough to catch Phyllis Young's last night live, so I'm going to have to listen to that on delay. Um, but I'm very hopeful that um, we can show up Richard Heinberg by having fewer technical problems doing it across the Atlantic than he had doing it in person in the room. Um, and maybe I can do a bit of the Rob Hopkins thing as well. Um, so yeah, Caroline's uh, given me a lovely introduction there and I'm very grateful to you all for um, attending because I'm aware there are seven other fascinating workshops going on right now um, that you could be in. And by the way, if I get really tedious, then by all means, uh, leave. <laughs> I won't be offended because there is loads of really great stuff going on over there. Um, and uh, as Caroline said, you should all have received a copy of Surviving the Future, um, which was, well, we'll talk a lot more about what that book is today. Um, but uh, hopefully by the end of this session, you'll have a much better idea of why Transition US were keen for you all to get a copy. And um, you know, I've spent the last few years really uh, producing the book and um, working on it in various ways, but I'm a terrible salesman because I've already given you all my product, so um, I've got nothing left to sell anymore. Uh, so all I can hope is that by the end of this um, 90 minutes, you'll just be really keen to actually open it and read it. Um, and we can explain, yeah, how it, how it connects with transition and what it's all about. And indeed with some of the things that uh, Rob and Richard have been talking about over the last couple of days. Um, and I'll talk more about this too, but uh, some of you, probably know that um, David Fleming was my uh, my sort of mentor really um, and late friend who passed away in uh, late 2010 um, so he was 
involved with the founding of the Green Party in this country. In fact, the, the Green Party office was his flat in Hampstead back in the 70s. Um, he was involved with the starting of a thing over here called the New Economics Foundation. He was chair of an organization called the Soil Association, which um, campaigns on organic food. Uh, and he was one of the real whistleblowers on, um, on peak oil as, a, as an issue working with Colin Campbell, the oil geologist, who some of you may be familiar with. Um, by training, he was a, a historian originally, um, but when he was uh, working in the early days of the, the sort of the Green Party or what was then called the Ecology Party over here, um, he was sort of urging his peers at that time, we need to learn the language of economics because it's the economists who keep telling us that what we're saying is unrealistic and can't be done. And so we need to meet them on their own ground and, and engage with what they're saying because otherwise we're not going to be taken seriously with this sort of ecology ecological agenda and by the time I met him in the late 2000s uh, 2006 um, he practiced what he preached and actually gone and got a PhD in economics so that he could um, make the case for um, for the ecology within within economics so I was, I was with Rob actually a couple of weeks ago at uh, Transition Town Tooting and he was saying the beautiful thing about David was that he he only learned economics so that he could try and put right the mess that all the other econ economists had caused, which I thought was a nice way of putting it. Um, and so, yeah, David spent about 30 years producing this epic tome, uh, Lean Logic, um, which is huge, as you can see, it's a 300,000 word uh, dictionary for the future and how to survive it. Um, and as uh, we'll hear from him actually a little later by video, um, it was a book that he never, why could ever say he'd finished. It was something he was always working on, always revising. And um, in my opinion, actually, he was arguably a bit, a bit scared to let it go for publication because it was so, so dear to his heart and such a life's work that the idea of putting it out there and, and it not really going anywhere and nobody really reading it, I think would have broken his heart. And in fact, uh, although we worked very closely on, um, I edited a lot of his work and he edited some of mine, and um, but he would never actually let me look at Lean Logic. Um, until only a few weeks before his very sudden and unexpected death, because he said it was it was too close to his heart, and we were too close. And if I was critical of it, we'd fall out, and he didn't want us to fall out. So um, after he died, uh, because he didn't really he didn't have children or, or particularly close family, I was involved with going through his his stuff and uh, his house being sold, etc. And I found the manuscript for Lean Logic on his home computer, um, and had the chance to read it and for me I mean conversations with David were um, one of the great the great joys of my life to date to be honest with you um, he had this incredible mind this incredible holistic thinker um, and for me who really had no peer group around this stuff until I met him and, and Rob in 2006 it was amazing to have someone who'd been involved with this movement for decades and you know, I'd say, oh, David, I read this amazing article by such and such. And he'd say, oh, ring her up, we'll have coffee. And, you know, it's this amazing ability to really um, meet everyone that, uh, that I was being inspired by and that I was impressed with. Um, and then I remember thinking after about six months, it was a bit, it was wonderful. And then it was a bit scary to realize at that time, it seemed like, wow, I've just met all my heroes in six months, but why are there only 25 of us? <laughs> you know, the, if these are the biggest issues in the world, like why is there not this huge, um, huge movement behind this and so after reading reading lean logic reading the manuscript was like an invitation to one last glorious conversation with David and as I read it I thought my god this really needs to be published this is an incredibly important book um, and this was yeah 2010 2011 um, and uh, I started talking to some friends in publishing and they were like, ah, it is amazing, but it's really huge. And it's in this strange dictionary Wikipedia type format and I'm not sure people will get it. And so then uh, myself and a couple of David's other friends started work on what would become this paperback, Surviving the Future. Um, so that's very briefly what the book is. We'll talk more about that. But um, what I really want to do with this workshop is that it's not just me talking because one of the key ideas in David's work um, is bottom-up participation. He didn't think it made sense for experts to solve the world's problems. He thought it made sense for ordinary people to get together and discuss the issues. They're the ones who best understand their local situation. They're the ones who best understand their needs and their abilities and their resources. Um, and so what he was really all about was 
offering people tools and encouraging them to um, to get on with figuring out the problems themselves and acting at the local level. Um, and as Rob often says, um, you know, David's work was one of the great inspirations behind the origins of transition. Uh, Rob, Rob, I remember described, I think a bit too humbly in fact, but Rob, Rob has said that uh, for him transition was just taking Richard Heinberg on peak oil and David Holmgren on permaculture and David Fleming on community and resilience rolling the three together and sort of transition just sort of fell out and he just had to make it comprehensible. Um, I think that rather underplays Rob's own role, but it gives a sense of um, the, the sort of weird timeline around these books in a way that they're only now reaching publication. Um, but because David was sharing drafts with a lot of sort of activists and thinkers and academics, um, they were actually hugely influential on things like transition a long time before they finally uh, reached print at the end of last year. Um, so because David's yeah, whole thing is about bottom up, I'd really like to make this as interactive as possible or as interactive as the technology will allow. Um, so in, in true transition fashion, I'd right now like to invite you to turn to your neighbor, the person you're sitting next to, preferably, ideally someone you don't know, um, and just talk for a couple of minutes each way about what's brought you to this workshop, why you, why you chose to um, come along to this, and then hopefully I can hear back from some of you um, afterwards and you know get a sense of what the interests in the room are and what we'd like to talk about and it doesn't necessarily need to be um you know something that you think i have anything to say about you know if you if the thing that's on your mind is something completely you know way out there you want to hear about i don't know brexit even though that happened years after david died or you want to hear about um you know how to talk to that cutie that you spotted at the previous workshop and you're hoping to uh, get to know a bit better you know whatever it may be part of the beauty of uh, of lean logic this huge dictionary is that it kind of covers everything um, and I've been when I when I first ran a workshop around these books um, I was trying to figure out how to convey that without possibly being able to read everything um, and I thought this was a good way of doing it, just get people to ask, you know, what they're interested in, what they're keen on. And there's always something in Lean Logic that, um, that I can pull out that addresses it. Um, so whether it's you want to know more about David or UK transition or something completely left field. Um, yeah. And so I invite you and Caroline can be your facilitator since I'm not in the room. Um, just uh, talk to each other for a few minutes each way and then we'll... Um, We'll see what uh, what we want to talk about for the rest of the session. Over to you, Caroline. So, Sean, you can give me a thumbs up when you want to end it. Yeah, I think so. Hear from people after these breakouts. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, let's bring these wonderful conversations to a nice, slow, gentle halt. And you can finish your thoughts and hopefully carry on at lunch <laughs> if you want to. All right, so Sean, I'm going to turn it over to you again, correct? Or did you, let's see, turn it over to you, then we'll um, take it from there. So yeah, just um, an invitation to you all to, if there's anything you want to share about what's brought you to this workshop or anything you'd like to hear more about, um, or any particular threads you want to pull out, I'd just um, like to hear about that, particularly if there's anything you really, really want to get out of this workshop, um, it'd be great to know what that is. So uh, um, hopefully Caroline in some way I'll be able to hear what people say, but if not, maybe you can relay it. Go ahead. So. Hello, um, Nicholas Albury was in England and he wrote the Book of Visions way back and but he was killed in a car wreck. And, uh, do you know anything that's following up on that? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Nicholas Albury. Should I look at? Yeah, because he'll see you. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Sean. My name is Eric Utney and I uh, reviewed Lean Logic and uh, Surviving the Future in a recent issue of Utney Reader. <clears throat> I'm very enthusiastic about them. And thank you for your great work. Um, I'm uh, particularly interested in hearing what you might say about uh, the sort of onslaught of technology, especially social technology, uh, and how Lean Logic might speak to that. In a more recent uh, column, I compared, well, no, it was that I compared Paul Hawkins' uh, Project Drawdown with Lean Logic. And I think there, that's a clash of paradigms. There are two completely different ways of looking at the world. Project Drawdown identifies a hundred, what Paul calls solutions for addressing and reversing global climate change. And I think a lot of people have because of Paul's previous work, especially uh, uh, Blessed Unrest, they have a good feeling about what Paul's talking about and feeling that he's a part of what transition is all about. And I think it's a very different paradigm. And I'm just wondering what you think about that and in, and in particular, what social technology is doing to our, our humanity, our ability to be in relationship, our ability to be present with each other. Et 
Um, okay, yeah. I mean, I was I was thinking maybe we'd hear a few um, few comments and then I'll I'll sort of weave them in as we go through. But that's absolutely something um, that both David talks a fair bit about, and uh, and I I've got a few things to say about as well. So um, let's hear a few more if they're if they're in the room and uh, and then I'll weave these things in over the course of the next um, hour or so. Hello, John. Uh, Mark Judeman, and uh, I was curious uh, to hear thoughts about uh, how to make capitalism less efficient, uh, how to build uh, slack into the system as discussed in the book. Uh, and also, I'm kind of intrigued by the idea of ritual and how important ritual might be in our, uh, in our newly transforming society. Thank you. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Jack Strasberg. And what I'm looking at is uh, to what extent are you looking at the uh, where transition is going in the sense of creating a, a very organized and coordinated movement that actually has the ability to have impact on what is going on on the planet? Others? Others? I need to. I can right oh, sorry. I'm Carolyn Bornhauser. I live um, part time in Germany and much of the time in Minneapolis. Um, I was I really responded to both of the previous um, uh, contributions. I think that um, we need a lot more ritual, music, art. This is the kind of thing that speaks to people's souls. And I'd love to see us doing much more singing and dancing, which is sort of my passion. <laughs> so that's part of why I'm saying this. But um, you know, we, what would have a civil rights movement have been without Pete Seeger? Um, the other thing is the social media. Thank you for bringing that up. I'm just presently shepherding three, shepherding three teenagers from Germany um, that are here for six weeks. And they're wonderful kids. They're, they're responsive and, you know, and relational kids. But I'm, I'm just appalled at how much they stick to their, to their um, you know, Tones. <laughs> just amazing how much they, they seem to, to really be dependent on this and it's really hard. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I, I resonate with what you've said very much. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Sean. I'm John Foran. Um, I live in a place known as Ecotopia, which is in uh, California somewhere. And <laughs> my passion is uh, the global climate justice movement and I'm interested in what what follows from this work that could be of use to building a global social movement of that kind? Hi, I'm Carolyn, and I, I came to just really hear why this book is so important. I know nothing about the book, and I really want to know why it's an important book. I'm Eric Lindbergh, and I, I'm really interested in your big picture approach, and I know your philosophical background, and I'm wondering what concepts you're working with these days, and what meta narratives. Any other questions here? That might be enough room to look at. <laughs> Okay, great, thank you all. Yes, as someone said, uh, that might keep me busy. Um, okay, and before we get into all of that, um, I'd like to introduce David Fleming to the room. Uh, I think we got unmuted, there we go. And um, partly because there are a couple of, uh, I have a few clips of him speaking, um, a couple of which actually quite directly address some of those points which I've noted down here. Um, but I don't have very much video footage of him, so I'd like to play this clip first that's um, a video clip of David, um, partly because when I read his words, I very much hear his voice, um, and I think that's, I think it's nice to know whose words you're reading, so I'd like to, um, yeah, play this clip. Uh, this first clip is, um, I'm not actually sure quite how long it is, a couple of minutes, I think, and, um, yeah, just introduce David since this is largely about his work. So um, hopefully if you can't see or hear this, someone will be able to shout at me to tell me so. But we tried it out the other day and it seemed to work. So see how we go.
And so are we at a time of a paradigm shift on mm. peak oil and climate change? Well, <clears throat> yeah, I think, I think uh, like the answer to a, to a lot of questions, I think the answer to that is we are and we aren't. I think we are in that you know, the world we're looking at is completely different from the world that you know, we've been brought up to suppose is OK. That is to say the world of the market economy, which depends on growth, um, which is not actually going to destroy the environment in any substantial way, and which has more than enough energy for the foreseeable future. We're no longer in that, in, in that paradigm. On the other, the other hand, as, as Thomas Kuhn pointed, um, point, pointed out, um, you know, one's not in a new paradigm till you're there. Uh, and there is a long period of, uh, of, of storm and stress um, during which people are becoming more and more uneasy about the paradigm that they're in and about the impossibilities and, anom and, and anomalies that develop during, during that time. Um, and uh, there, is a, there, there is a time of great, great difficulty and, 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 and turbulence, like, 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 like water um, you know, flowing from one pool to another down, down, down a waterfall. And I don't believe that we're yet in, our, in the next pool, so to speak. I don't yet think we are yet in a, a, new, in, in a new paradigm. For a whole lot of reasons. One is, I mean, there are lots of reasons. One is we, you know, you know, as the people who, are sort of, who know about climate change, recognise that you know, actually it is worse than is widely recognised. So there is a question about whether, whether that's soluble. There's certainly a question about whether the, whether the energy problem is, is, is soluble. Even if one goes down the optimistic route of building large um, solar arrays in the Sahara Desert and, and having cables around the rest of the world providing us with energy, you know, th there is a good deal of scepticism about, about whether technical fixes like that, like that, like that would work. And above all, or maybe above all, um, there is the problem about economic growth itself. I mean, the market economy absolutely depends for its structural stability on economic growth. That's not because banks want to big, uh, earn, earn big money and big, get, get big paybacks. It's not because of bankers' bonuses, for nothing like that, for no trivial reason. It's just a system which is a fundamentally, um, a, 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 it's the fundamental nature of the system. We're living in a dynamic system, and dynamic systems are like bicycles. They only stay stable and upright so long as they're moving forward. There is no way the market economy can exist without growth. Um, and so uh, if, one, if growth were to stop um, for a substantial amount of time, um, or still worse, if, if growth were actually to go into reverse, then the market economy would collapse uh, and collapse. Uh, and I'll leave you to our imagination to imagine what that collapse would, what collapse would mean. So that if one is looking, which all, all of us should be looking for a, ta looking for a time when, uh, for a, a non-growing economy, and we have to have an economy which isn't growing. Indeed, we have to have an economy which has shrunk a good deal, a long way from where, where it is now. We have to have that. Unless we can do that, we're going to be in trouble. So we've had it either way, in a way. Um, if, we, if, if, we, if, if we grow, if we, 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 we're stuffed if we grow, and we're stuffed if we don't grow. And that means that we, we're not in a paradigm. It's very, very hard for anybody, anybody, hand on heart, to say, this is the way forward. It's going to be perfectly OK, um, people. Uh, we, we, have, we have a solution. And that is what Thomas Kuhn was talking about. He was talking about a, a comprehensive par par paradigm with some tweaks that needed to be developed. Um, but he wasn't talking about enormous question marks. And unfortunately, really, uh, instead of this alternative paradigm, all we can offer really is a most enormous planet sized question marks. Okay, so hopefully you all saw and heard that, okay. Um, so that's that's David uh, actually in his in his flat in Hampstead, which, uh, as I mentioned, was the Green Party office here originally when it was first started. Um, and that was in 2009. Um, so it's interesting how, uh, what's that, eight years ago now, um, still seeming very topical to our present moment. And I think um, a couple of the questions we had were about how, um, oh, actually, there's one thing I want to ask you. Can people in the room raise their hand if they uh, have read, say, a substantial, what they would consider a substantial amount of David Fleming's work? Because I know some of you asked questions that implied that you had and some hadn't. So there's just a few hands raised there. So most of you are not that familiar with his work. Okay, good. It's good to know. Yeah, bit in the middle. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, so yeah, really, for those who aren't that familiar with his work, which I think is most of you, um, that was his view of the problem, that we've got this situation where we've got a, an, an economy that's based on growth. And I heard one of the questions for Richard Heinberg's Q&A was, um, you know, can you point me at some good work on how on earth we, how we deal with this problem? You know, we're damned if we grow and we're damned if we don't, what on earth do we do about it? And for me personally, that was, um, that was kind of the point I got to 
um, five or six years ago, I was thinking, well, you know, what on earth do we do in response to this? And the reason that I devoted my last few years to getting David Fleming's work out there is to me, it's, it's the most compelling grounded answer to that that I found. And that's why it seemed to me a very important piece of work to get out there. Um, and so I'd like to, so I'm now going to play an audio clip of David, which is from an interview that he did actually just a few weeks before he died. But curiously, he did it um, up an oak tree. <laughs> um, there was a young man named Henrik Dahler who was going around uh, basically interviewing thinkers up trees. And, um, and he got David up this oak tree on Hampstead Teeth. So um, we only have the audio from this. But I think he very addresses, as you'll hear, he addresses very much, as you'll hear, um, a couple of questions that, uh, that you all put to me. Um, and will be a good way into the explanation for Carolyn about um, why I think this book's important and, uh, and worth reading. So I'll try and uh, share this clip with you now. One of the first things we ought to do about, if we're really going to understand economics, is forget economics altogether. But we ought, ought to be thinking about economics. We ought to think be thinking about people, thinking about thinking about um, well, yes, our relationships, and and uh, and 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 not even think about our relationships. Well, people are going to think about my relationship. I have a good relationship with Beth, with Beth on the whole, apart from when she disagrees with me, which she doesn't do it too often. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't spend. I should be rooting. I don't spend a lot of time thinking about our relationship. We just do it. We just get on with life, you know. And I think the best relationship about that. And I think the the, 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 the book is all really about getting on with life and crucially getting on in, in, in life in the things that really matter. What what really matters is music. And, music. Yeah, and 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 humour, and 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 com conversation, and um, painting, and the, the arts, uh, yeah. and um, things like that, and and, and and having fun, play, yeah. and and, yeah. and farting about, and generally enjoying life. That's what really, really matters. Everything, everything else is just almost sort of a, just a, a kind of sort of what, oh, just sort of the, the uh, well, sort of the, the needle hiss, as we used to say in the old days of gramophone records. Now you probably are too young to know that that expression anyway. <laughs> needle hiss. Yeah, I know, I know needle hiss. <laughs> That is it. It's a sort of just of the foundation. Uh, the most of the rest of life is just the foundation on which what really matters is going to be built, and what really matters uh, is is culture and play and music. And those, those are things. So, uh, so that I think <laughs> there seems to be a lot of positivity about that in the room, and um, and so really what he was doing was thinking, well, how do we build an economic system? which instead of our current system, which is all, of, you know, all about competitiveness and taking every moment and making it as productive and efficient as possible and leaves as little room as possible for, um, for all the things that are really important, which it sees as uh, what economists call spare labor, i.e. You know, time that isn't being pushed into productivity. Um, David's question was, how can we build what he calls a slack economy, an economy which doesn't require that? And that's very, very difficult. Um, for reasons which are explained in Surviving the Future. Um, but I think it's what's really exciting about David's work is it's an economic paradigm which is completely different from the one that we're living in. And I'm going to play um, another short clip from David from that same interview, which speaks a little bit more about this. Um, and then I'll, uh, I'll uh, rest the floor back from David because he just keeps, you know, speaking and I can't shut him up. So, um, so yeah, one more clip from David and then I'll uh, pick up some more of the threads that you've asked about. And we tend to think we're never. If we if talk to to most people about this, they would say, "Come on, pull pull the other one. This is not this is not realistic." But actually, we also need to recognise how crucially important the the informal economy already is now. And most of the thing what we're doing right now is in the informal economy. We're not getting not not, not getting paid for this. Um, our family life is informal. All our friends are part of the informal economy. Most of the things with people in our sort of kind of light life do a part of the informal economy we do things for each other constantly all the time uh, and uh, if I were to do something if I was to do something for a friend and they were to offer to pay me I would be mortally insulted that'd be more or less the end of yeah, it yeah, yeah. so the thing is we tend to oh come off come off in the informal economy this is terribly romantic uh, unrealistic on the, on, the, on the contrary it's a very unrealistic to dismiss the important the informal economy of being, of being unimportant so it's going to be a, 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 a big rediscovery of the, inf the the informal economy but it's very hard very hard to summarize <laughs> but how does it okay the, you're doing a lot of research about how things have worked and how th and you've obviously got ideas about how things could work but you know we've got this whole financial system 
are you you're talking about replacing that with something else no, unfortunately, I'm not. I don't think it's going to last. I mean, I think a lot. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a capitalist. I'm, I'm a bit of a, sort of a, a right winger to, to most people's horror, horror, and shock. And so, I think in many ways, the system, <laughs> the system we've got at the moment is really it's not a bad system. I think capitalism is a, is a good thing. The only problem with capitalism is that it destroys the planet, you know, um, and that right. it's it, it's based on growth. I mean, apart from those two little details, it's got a lot to be said in its favour. Yeah. And when capitalism dies, you know, we'll be on our knees. We'll, we'll be we'll, we'll wish it was back because it's um it supports a, a high standard of living. It supports freedoms. I mean, from the point of view of freedom, we're an incredibly free society, and mm. that is basically to d- d- do with the, the, the capitalist system we've got. So it's a wonderful system in, in a way. It's very efficient. It's based on pull. It's not based on authoritarian people telling other people what to do on the whole. It's based on people in, uh, ask, asking for services and, and paying for them. So in many ways, it's got a lot to be said in its favour. But you've got the absolute, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. It's got these absolutely crucial flaws, um, which is, well, the, the essential flaw is it depends on growth. Um, and um, uh, and uh, and it will go on. It will go on depending on growth to the point at, at which, it, at which, at which it collapses. Uh, it's not necessarily an argument against a system that it collapses because most systems do collapse in the end. I mean, that's a part of the nature of the wheel of life. You know, systems do collapse, and there is life and death. So I think I, I, I'm to some extent slightly inclined to forgive capitalism for for uh, being about to collapse. I mean, there are lots of fine things, there are lots of love affairs and, which have, have come to a sticky end and lots of novels which come to an end and life tends to come to an end. I mean, life itself comes to an end. You can't necessarily blame life for being something that comes to an end. So I'm not really going to blame capitalism. On the other hand, it does. I mean, uh, uh, it's, it's quite quite a thing to be held that it, you know, quite, quite an accusation. You know, hard, hard for it to live down. The accusation is not only is it... Uh, is it is it um, based on on the ludicrous idea that growth can continue indefinitely, but it's going to destroy the entire planet with it? I mean, that's 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 quite a lot. That, that's, that's, a that's, a, that's a that's a big problem. It's a big. It not, it's not a small problem. It's a, it's a fairly <laughs> sort of fundamental <laughs> pro- problem. There. But anyway, the thing is, so the thing is, as uh, as uh, as um, it is uh, going to um, hit the buffers in, in, in this way, we don't have to. You know, go around uh, destroying things. We don't have to dismantle the banking system and, and something. But whatever we do with the banking system, it will make absolutely no difference at all. We do not have to change, reform things. I'm not a reformer. I don't think we should bother. Uh, we should, we should uh, waste time reforming things. It's going to reform itself in that it's going to come to um, um, uh, falling about our ears very, very quickly indeed. And indeed, the longer we, sister, we keep the system going, in some ways, you could argue, the longer we keep the system going, uh, the, 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 the longer the growth will continue, and the greater will be the fall when it eventually happens. The more nuclear power stations we'll be, we'll be able to build, build, build. Uh, the more forests we'll be able to cut down, the greater the CO2 uh, accumulations when eventually the crash happens. Um, so there is something to be said, actually, for, uh, for the crash being earlier rather than later. Okay. So that gives you a bit more of a sense of, uh, of the man and his work and his perspective and indeed his humour. Um, and uh, I, should, I should mention, I was uh, intending to do this before that clip, this, this term, the informal economy. Um, so uh, that's equivalent to a term a lot of people use, the gift economy. Um, and uh, basically, as David was saying, it's, the, it's basically the economy of all the things we do when we're not otherwise obliged to, when we're not having to earn some money so it's you know it's volunteering and it's time with family and it's time doing music and it's time in play and carnival and community so the informal economy which in our present economics is seen as this sort of residual thing um but as david says is actually really the core of our economy uh, it's still that it's within the informal economy that the children are raised and, and language is learned and it's the informal economy that we go back to and what's really compelling about David's work is with his background in sort of history and anthropology um, that he points out that really the almost all of human history um, was based in the informal economy that actually this this growth based market economy has only really been around for two or three hundred years but that's been just long enough that people of our generations were born into it and our parents were born into it and so we have this sense that it's normal and in fact it's incredibly abnormal it's this weird historical anomaly um and and it's unsustainable as richard heimberg was saying in his keynote it's really important to remember that unsustainable means it's going to end and so for david the, if, if i could summarize you know what david advocates that we do now um, it's rebuilding the two economies that always supported us before the market economy and will have to support us after. And those are the informal economies, so our communities, our relationships, our family connections, and 
the ecology, nature, which is the other thing that's always supported us. Um, and so those, those were always the priorities that, you know, there's so much of a, um, a yearning, I think, for um, a sort of lost time of, of community and conviviality and slack and conversation. People yearn for that, but we're sort of taught to think that that's, that's just a bit quaint and a bit outdated and, you know, oh, well, bless you, but, you know, things have moved on from that. Whereas what David's work really does is, is bring home to us in a very empowering way actually rebuilding that is the most urgent and critical work we can do because when the market economy fails that's what's going to have to catch us and if it's as weakened as it is at present it's not going to be in good shape to do that um and so really that was what his work was about was the priority on um rebuilding the informal economy and rebuilding the ecology but one thing i i really like about his work as you heard in that clip tongue-in-cheek to some extent but nonetheless he recognizes that you know there are good things about how our economy is now. There are things that people enjoy, there are comforts, there are freedoms, at least for some. Um, and, uh, you know, we shouldn't pretend that they're not there, otherwise we just come across as um, not taking into account the full picture. But of course, those, those comforts are built on massive exploitation, not just of other human beings, but of the whole, the whole natural ecology as well. Um, and so as people in this room are probably well aware, um, it's not just a case of, oh, wouldn't it be nice to do that? It's also a case of, well, actually, there's, there's a kind of moral imperative to um, rebuild an economy that isn't built, built on exploitation. And there's a practical imperative that actually the, the market economy is, is inherently unsustainable anyway. Um, and so that's why actually partly why we've been giving the books away, because it feels like that ties in with the message of the books really they're very much about getting away from the monetary market economy um, and so it felt very appropriate to offer them in the spirit of a gift um, and my work on the books over the last few years has been unpaid so you know it's been sort of my gift to the world in that I felt that this was um, really important work that needed to be um, needed to be shared and that in fact people were really yearning for um, and so I hope uh, to one of <laughs> good, good to know. Thank you. And um, and I hope that uh, for the I think we had two questions from Carolyn's, but for the one who knew nothing about the book and wondered why it's important, I hope I'm hope starting to give a bit of a sense of that. And I was very interested during uh, Rob's keynote. Um, he showed that advert from Amazon, which I think you will have all seen him do. And um, he, the people he called Dave and Doris in there, and that that sort of very um homogenized isolated kind of culture that we're being sold constantly by the best advertising and marketing companies on the planet and how terrifying that is actually but i really loved what he said about um when you stop mowing the grass the diversity starts to return um and that's what's quite hopeful about david's vision is that he's saying well actually you know much as that whole technological and 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 financial edifice likes to present itself as the obvious way forward, it's actually um, extremely naive. And I think I'd like to read a little bit from Surviving the Future, actually, um, that I think addresses that very directly. Um, <laughs> maybe I'll explain that I had, this, I had this strange moment when I was starting to create this book, Surviving the Future, and think about how it might be structured, that uh, because Lean Logic, the dictionary, is structured in dictionary format so it's it, in many ways it's like david pre-invented wikipedia um, so you might think oh i'm really interested in i don't know community and you start reading about that but then there are little asterisks next to any word that has its own entry elsewhere and at the end of each entry there's a list of related entries so it becomes like a sort of choose your own adventure book um, and uh and so with with the paperback surviving the future which you will have uh, what i did was i basically picked one of those pathways through lean logic um, and pulled that out into a conventional read it front to back narrative book, um, which is in some ways a shame because it loses some of the holism of David's thinking that you can kind of see how everything connects to everything else. But nonetheless, I think it does provide a, a way in, maybe even a gateway drug to the, uh, to the full work. Um, but one of the things I realized surprisingly late on in the process of thinking about this book was that it needed to have an ending because uh, that's what books that you read front to back do um, and a dictionary doesn't have an ending and so I had to somehow figure out how how to close the book um, and the approach that I took was uh, creating an epilogue um, which drew on different entries from Lean Logic um, 
as a kind of closing, I'd like to read you a little bit from the epilogue, which I think addresses a couple of the points um, you were asking. The great transformation has already happened. It was the revolution in politics, economics and society that came with the market economy and which hit its stride in Britain in the late 18th century. Most of human history had been bred, fed and watered by another sort of economy that the market has replaced as far as possible the social capital of reciprocal obligation, loyalties, authority structures, culture and traditions with exchange, price and the impersonal principles of economics. Unfortunately, the critics of economics have had a tendency to discuss the whole structure as a tissue of misconceptions. It is a critique that fails. The strength of economics is its considerable, if far from complete, understanding of the flows and comparative advantages that underlie trade, jobs, capital and incomes, and the logic of optimizing behavior, all backed by glittering accomplishments in mathematics. That makes it a powerful analytical instrument so that just a few misconceptions, such as a failure to understand the informal economy or resource depletion, can have leverage. Like a baby monkey at the controls of a Ferrari, they can turn it into an instrument with extraordinarily destructive potential. If it were a tissue of errors, it would not be dangerous. It is its 90% brilliance which makes it so. Indeed, the government's main task in a mature market economy is to keep it free of obstacles that might stop it growing like a bemused farmer would treat the enchanted goose, keep the foxes out so that it can go on magically laying its golden eggs. The market's achievements and answers sound authoritative and final, but what is truly most significant about them is how naive they are. If the flow of income fails, the powerfully bonding combination of money and self-interest will no longer be available on its present all-embracing scale, and perhaps not at all. And it must inevitably fail as the market's taught competitiveness demands ever-increasing productivity and thus relies on the impossibility of perpetual growth. In the meantime, the reduction of a society and culture to dependence on mathematical abstraction has infantilized a grown-up civilization and is well on the way to destroying it. Civilizations self-destruct anyway, but it is reasonable to ask whether they have done so before with such enthusiasm and in obedience to such an acutely absurd superstition, all while claiming with such insistence that they were beyond being seduced by the irrational promises of religion. Every civilization has had its irrational but reassuring myth. Previous civilizations have used their culture to sing about it and tell stories about it. Ours has used its mathematics to prove it. Yet, when that relatively short-lived market society is gone, we will miss its essential simplicity, its price mechanism, its self-stabilizing properties, its impersonal exchange, the comforts it delivers to many and the freedoms it underwrites. Its failure will be destructive. And the end is in sight. During the early decades of the century, the market will lose its magic. It is the aim of Lean Logic to suggest some principles for repairing or replacing the atrophied social structures on which most human cultures were built as the basis for a cohesive society that might survive the turbulent times to come. So that's what, uh, <laughs> oh, lots of wavy hands back there. Um, so that's what, um, what David's work was all about, um, you know, from the 60s, 70s on, he was writing this book up till sort of 2000s. And weirdly, um, when the books came out in September, um, Everyone talked about how timely and topical they were, <laughs> which struck me as interesting sort of seven years after the guy who wrote it died and probably 20 years after he wrote much of it. So maybe in some weird way, this, this, this strange timing of the publication of the books has, um, has worked out well. And, and when, when Rob was talking about that, you know, stop mowing the grass and the diversity starts to return. And also about um, path creators, yes, that lovely slide of... Uh, of the, uh, the experts path and then the path that ordinary people have made just by walking where they wanted to go. Um, I think transition is absolutely brilliant at walking the paths we want to walk and um, rebuilding local economies, getting people talking to each other again, reaching out to people. But I think for some of us, um, 
it's really important as well to have a sense of the big picture. Um, like some people I know from experience are just like, ah, I don't care, this is good. All I need to know is this is good and I'm happy to do it. Um, I'm more of the kind of, well, I need to know how this contributes to something bigger because these big picture trends are utterly terrifying. Um, and uh, obviously, as I mentioned, it was David's work that really inspired um, a lot of the kind of origins of transition over here. Um, and I think it's it's really wonderful now to have these books as a kind of um, uh, something to point to when people say, well, isn't transition just a bit quaint and, you know, just a bit naive and it's just, you know, people doing stuff at the local level. That's not really very important, is it? You know, the mega trends are, you know, Google and Microsoft. And, um, and so, you know, this is a work of rigorous economics but it doesn't read like a word of rig a, a book of rigorous economics it reads like a book of of, of warm conviviality um and uh and the kind of the kind of future that we actually want to run towards rather than rather than reluctantly accepting um and one of the questions i had was about uh, from the other carolyn was about ritual and, and music and art i think uh, mark as well mentioned ritual um, and for those who've delved into Surviving the Future, or those who, who want to have a recommendation on uh, my favourite bit <laughs> of Surviving the Future, I strongly recommend um, Chapter 4 on Carnival, um, which is just one of the most joyous and nourishing things I've ever read. Um, just a real reminder of, as David said, what really matters in life. Um, and it's not economics and mathematics it's it's community and conviviality and rebuilding um rebuilding what really matters to us all and again as richard heinberg i think was saying uh the other night uh, or the other day for you um it's this sense of can we not just reduce the number and severity of casualties as you know various unfortunate trends unfold but how do we lay the groundwork for recovery and the building of a sustainable culture that's that's worthy of survival a story that we're actually really proud and excited to be part of um because you know, david in no way shied away from the fact that we're headed for collapse and it was very interesting actually reading rich Heinberg wrote an article the other day i think called uh, are we doomed let's have a chat i think it was titled um, and I thought it was a brilliant piece, but it's, I, I think, um, you know, I don't think Richard would have written that piece 10 years ago. And towards the end, he recommended Surviving the Future as one of the books that people should read to help them think through this stuff. Because I think, um, for me, for, for quite a while now, I've felt like the only things I can wholeheartedly give myself to are things which feel like, if there were a great cultural turning towards sanity, this work would have played a part in it. But it also makes sense even if there isn't, because even though that great cultural turning is what I want to see and what I'm shooting for, it's not what I predict. Um, and so for, for my full heart to be um, in what I'm doing, it needs to make sense in both of those scenarios. Um, and, uh, and yeah, bringing these books out really, um, yeah, really felt like one way of doing that. I'm just going to look at my notes about what else people were asking about. Um, so yeah, Jack's question was about, you know, where is transition going and, and the, the structure that it's building and, and what impact that could have for me. Um, this is a really important part of that. I think part of the reason that transition really excites me um, and excited me, you know, from the outset is it's a third way, if you like, um, from the ways that we're always told to try and change the world. Um, I mean, I always, I always say we can't not change the world. All of us will inevitably change the world. If we follow the most um, default, do what they tell you, you know, just follow the mainstream line, then that's the kind of world that we're, that we're helping to create and reinforce. Whatever we do will change the world in some way. Um, but the things we're always told to do to kind of change the course of society are, you know, lobby our politicians, which can feel very disheartening because they just ignore us on the whole, or personal lifestyle change, which can feel very disheartening because it feels like a drop in the ocean and the whole world's going the other way. And I think what's really exciting about transition is that it's, um, it's acting on a scale where you're working with your community and so you can achieve things which you can see happen and are meaningful, you know, whether that's 
um, you know, growing food or a roundabout or getting a park turned into a growing space or getting a road turned into a, an area where kids can play or whatever it may be that you're, you're working on locally. You can, that's a scale where you can see the impact that you're making, but it's also a scale that's small enough where your voice is important and you can actually see your contribution and, and, and make a difference and, and shape which direction it goes in. And I think that's partly why over the last 10 years transition has you know spread 50 countries and inspired all of all of us me and all of you um and so um so yeah i hope that this will play a part in uh, kind of emboldening transition um to feel like you know it really is as richard was saying you know the most important thing we could be doing um in whatever ways we can do it is rebuilding the informal economy and the ecology because that's what's going to have to catch everyone who's left human and non-human um yeah carolyn was asking about ritual music art obviously david was speaking about that and um uh and it's you know it's it's uh his books are are riven through with that um you know, it's all about how do we how do we bring those things back into the heart of our everyday lives um and uh Eric Lindbergh, I think, um, yeah, I've talked quite a lot about some of the big pictures and meta narratives that are really exciting me. This is this is why, um, yeah, this is why these books have seemed like the most worthy thing I can do, as well, of course, as being, um, you know, a tribute to a man that I loved and am deeply grateful for for helping me to um, build a life around doing what's important to me. Um, I mean, maybe a slight diversion I can make there is that my the, the key to my life over the last um, 12 years I guess um, was that back in 2005 I was uh, I was managing a learning center for marginalized groups so working with drug misusers and people with mental health problems and um, young asylum seekers and I really loved that work but in my spare time um, I was learning about particularly peak oil and climate change at that time and I was feeling like, well, <laughs> I'm helping these people reintegrate with society, which is all well and good. But if society itself is running off a cliff, then that no longer seems like um, the most important place I can put my energies. Um, but I had no idea you know, how to engage with that. And uh, as it turned out, about 18 months later, I went to a course, an amazing place in, in Devon in England called Schumacher College, which is where I met David Fleming and Rob Hopkins and Richard Heinberg and others who all taught me there. Um, but the key to that for me was, and I didn't have the terminology for it at the time, but the key to that for me was withdrawing from the formal economy as much as possible. Um, so I quit my job um, and I didn't get another one. And um, I learned to live as cheaply as I possibly could. And since then I've been living on, I don't know, maybe four or 5,000 pounds a year. Um, and that frees me up to not have to earn money, which means I can spend all my time doing stuff that I'm really passionate about rather than spending time doing what someone else wants me to do and will pay me for. Um, and I've never found anything that I could buy with money that would be more valuable than spending all my time doing stuff I really care about. Um, so that's, you know, that was my sort of personal path that allowed me to have the time to engage with this crazy crazy transition idea that Rob was talking about at Schumacher, which has since gone so big and, and writing the, the transition book that I wrote and then meeting David and working with him. All of that has been made possible by not earning very much money. And, um, and it's only later when I was sort of working on David's books after his death that I kind of realized, oh, this is what I did. You know, I stepped out of the formal economy and stepped into the informal economy and started, you know, living on the basis of staying with friends and family and um, being supported by people and, and living, staying in squats and, you know, just other ways of supporting yourself than financial ways. Um, and it, we, I think one of the key things that as a, not just as a movement, but I think that people <laughs> need to do is learn again how to rely for their needs on each other rather than on money. Um, we tend to think, what do I need to get by? Well, I need to have this amount of income. You know, if I'm going to retire, then I need to set aside this much money. Whereas, you know, I don't think that way. I think if I'm, if I'm going to live that long, then I need to have really strong relationships and I need to have places that I can be, but I don't need financial reserves. Um, Charles Eisenstein is uh, another excellent thinker around this stuff. And he has this lovely um, point that he makes that we talk about 
um, financial independence as being this very desirable, honourable thing to achieve in one's life. Like, oh, I don't rely on anyone else. I'm independent. Like, that's a good thing. But in fact, it's a complete myth. Um, in fact, if, if you're very rich, you're completely reliant on other people in just the same way. You're just reliant on people you don't know. Um, you go to the supermarket to buy your food. Well, someone still grew that food and someone still delivered it and someone still packaged it. And you can just get it with your money. And if you fall out with the supermarket people, you can go to another supermarket. But you're still reliant on the people who did that work. Um, the only thing that lots of money allows you to do is change the people, <laughs> make them dispensable. If, if you don't get on with the shopkeeper, you just go to another shop. Whereas if you actually have a relationship with your food, then you can't do that. And I think actually within the, I don't know, the green movement, you might say, we have an equivalent to that mistake of thinking that financial independence is a good thing, which we call self-sufficiency, which I think is the same mistake, just dressed up in green clothing. It's this idea that what we need to do is extract ourselves from culture and just rely on ourselves. And it's not, it's good, it's progress that it's not um, measured in terms of money, it's instead measured in terms of, you know, food and energy and things that we really do need. But it's still the same mistake. It's still thinking that what I need to do is look after me or my family rather than opening up to a sense of community and conviviality and you know one thing that climate change teaches us i think is that there is no um there's no lonely way out of our predicament if you, if you like um you know i think during the 60s and 70s there was a big sense of oh my god this system is just destroying everything well we're going to drop out and just you know step aside um, and the machine can crash on that way, but if I'm if I'm small and I'm self-sufficient, then it won't notice, and I can you know do something good here. And unfortunately, we can now see with climate change and several other the mass extinctions and all the other crises that there isn't going to be anywhere to step aside. Um, that the 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 system is having big enough impacts that you know if it makes our climate one which is no longer benign, then it's not going to be sustainable to live on a small farm being self-sufficient so i think you know there's a real challenge for all of us in that that the the only way through this um situation that we're in collectively is is collective and that's really hard because you know our collective decision making processes go under the name of politics right and politics has been claimed and co-opted by this huge system and so the really difficult questions come around you know yes you know, we can see that that system's um, heading for a collapse, but is it going to take down our life support systems on the way through? And that's where I think um, this question from Mark comes in, you know, how do we build slack into capitalism? Um, and that I think is what's really exciting about, about David's work is that, um, actually, I've got another very short clip. I think it's only about 30 seconds. I've got another short clip I'm going to play from David before I speak to that idea if you will human and that's one of the great things about <laughs> transition you, one does not need to wait for the crash before one starts experimenting thinking about these things and 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 and, and, and doing them i mean absolutely that's precisely why transition is so brilliant i want one so there's no way the crash is is a necessary condition for these things to be <coughs> to be done or experimented in or, 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 thought, or thought about. Um, and you know, the longer, from that point of view, the longer the crash is postponed, the better, um, because the more time you'll have to, to, to think about the, these things. So the, the yeah, ex postponement of the crash could be a good thing and a bad thing in, in, in various different ways. Probably, on balance, it probably would probably be a good thing. Yeah. So again. You know, one of the things I really like about David is he doesn't claim to have all the answers. He often recognizes the, the dilemmas and the balance of both sides of things. And, you know, in the same way that Richard was saying, you know, we're the ones who showed up. Um, and I think someone, and maybe it was even um, John, uh, was sort of challenging him on that, saying, well, there are a lot of people who aren't in this room. Um, and I think that's absolutely right. But I think, um, I thought Richard, Richard's answer didn't maybe hit, the, hit the, the right note there because it seems to me that, for me, when I would say we are the ones who showed up, I wouldn't just be talking about those of us in the room right now. I would be talking about that whole, you know, blessed unrest movement um, globally. Um, but nonetheless, we're still strongly in the minority. Um, 
but nonetheless, that, that big movement um, of which transition is one part, um, I think we're the ones, in a way, who are deciding whether or not it's a good thing if the crash is postponed. Um, I often talk about it like a, like a visit to the dentist. You know, you've got a toothache and it's getting worse, but you really don't want to go to the dentist. And uh, yet, you know that the longer you leave it, the worse it's going to be. And we're kind of in that situation with our economics. The, the, the crash is looking inevitable and the longer we leave it, the worse it's going to be. But we still don't want it to happen. And especially our politicians don't want it to happen on their watch. They want it to happen on the other team's watch. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the really interesting questions, because um, I personally, and I have friends who strongly disagree with this, but personally, I think that um, I can't make a significant impact on um, when that crash is going to happen. Um, you know, the, the kind of gears that are whirring in terms of the global financial crisis are much bigger than me and I'm going to have very limited impact on them. Um, so what does it make sense to do? For me, it doesn't make sense to try and sabotage it and bring it down faster. And it certainly doesn't make sense to try and prop it up and keep it going longer. What makes sense is to, again, rebuild the ecology, rebuild the informal economy, rebuild the things that are going to catch us after it's gone. Um, because yeah, maybe maybe the whole um, natural ecosystem will be so degraded by that point that there's nothing we can do. But if that's the world I was born into, well, then okay, there's nothing I can do. But as long as there's a shot that I can make things a little better than they would otherwise have been, then that's what I want to do with my life. And indeed, what's great about David's work and what's carried through into transition is that when you're doing this kind of work, it's fun. <laughs> it's not like, oh, God, I have to go for another day's slog of you know, carnival with my community or I have to go through another slog of having a wonderful conversation or playing some music or no, it's it's like let's let's actually build a way of life that's joyous and wonderful that isn't just some quaint throwback, but that we recognise actually has real authority as being a, a, a path forward into our future. Um and I think that ties in with this thread that Eric Lutney was asking about, which is um technology and social media. And um, I was reading a, a piece just yesterday um, from uh, a socialist website, I think called the World of Socialism or something. Um, but they found that uh, since Google decided that it was going to clamp down on fake news, um, suddenly all sorts of radical left-wing sites have found that their, the number of references they're receiving from Google have plummeted. Um, so anyone who's trying to look for non-mainstream thinking via Google, it's just got an awful lot harder to find it. Um, and all the studies show that the first two pages of search results on Google are the only ones that 99.9% .9 of people look at. And those are now completely populated by approved ideas, right? Um, and so this is incredibly dangerous. This is an ossification of, um, of our culture. You know, so much of our um, access to information is mediated through search engines and the, what they call filter bubbles. Some of you are familiar with that context, that a search engine will, um, if you type something into Google and someone else types the same thing into Google, you will get different results. And that's because it looks at various aspects of you and your behavior and what you're interested in, which, which things you've clicked on previously when you've looked at Google, etc. So that means that you might think, oh, look, I'm, you know, reading all these different points of view on this, this thing. But actually, you're just being fed what Google thinks you will like to read, which means probably stuff you already agree with. And the person over the street who has, holds these completely crazy views that nobody could possibly agree with is also being fed loads of stuff that completely agrees with them. And this is a very isolating thing. And as Rob was saying, if we're all living in our, in our nice, clean, unused kitchens with our partner and and not even being able to share recipes without it being mediated by Amazon, then what happens is we lose all ability to be communal other than in these very tightly constrained groups. Um, and it's, it's not hard to see why that's dangerous. And similarly, social media, uh, whether that's Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, what you've got is some of the most well-paid engineers on the planet are spending all their working days working to make 
that more compulsive to get you more addicted to social media that you know you go and look at one article on a page and then you see an interesting link and you click through that and you see an interesting link and you click through that and wait where did the last three hours go there's a reason that keeps happening it's because all the research funding goes into the psychology and into the engineering and into the design that's necessary to make that as compulsive as it possibly can because unfortunately the internet economy is built on click-throughs and views so if you um get loads of people looking at your site and clicking to other pages on your site then you can get more money by selling advertising on that site that targets them um and as uh, one of the key thinkers in internet world said i forget his name um unfortunately we when we designed it that way we didn't realize that if you're driving down a road and there's a car crash everyone looks so what we've created is a device that just feeds everyone car crashes all the time because that's what they look at and that's what they want um, and there's a lot of people starting to realize what a disaster this is, but unfortunately in the meantime, um, we've got a whole generation growing up and I, you know, include ourselves in that, who are being, having our perception shaped in the same way that a newspaper editor used to have great power over what the country thought about things. It's dwarfed now by the power that the editors at, at Facebook and Google have to decide what information we read, what information we can access, and who gets to read what. So I think this is an incredibly important thing that you raise, Eric, and I think you're absolutely right. I, I absolutely loved your Clash of Paradigms review of, of Lean Logic and, and Project Drawdown. Um, and uh, indeed, it was forwarded to me by a friend who absolutely loved it as well. And I think it's absolutely right that we need to be very wary of this um, techno fixation, as I call it, this idea that, um, the solution to all the world's problems is technology and that technology will help us to get to know each other better and to solve all our problems and when in fact you know technology has been advancing at an astonishing rate um, over the last couple of hundred years and those are the couple of hundred years where all these fundamental existential crises have emerged so it seems very odd to think that the obvious path to solving them is technology when most of the problems that we're having are caused by the solutions to previous problems <laughs> that we tried to solve with technology. Um, there were so many um, externalities, as, as people called them. Um, you know, climate change was just an externality. Well, all we're doing is putting a bit of gas out into the atmosphere and the world's huge and it would be really arrogant of us to think that we can, um, we can impact it. Um, and yet, you know, here we are with climate scientists and that famous piece in the New Yorker the other, the other week, you know, saying, that we could be looking at uh, mass ex I saw a survey actually, I don't know how reliable it is, I didn't look up the source, but it said that 40% of Americans uh, believe that climate change will lead to human extinction. I don't know if anyone else saw that, saw that survey, I can't remember what the source was, but I was quite astonished by that when, uh, you know, when, um, when there are political leaders in your country who, uh, who were so determined to um, sabotage any action on it. Um, so I think that's addressed all of points. Of, oh, well, climate justice. I mean, I, I touched on that. Um, I mean, to my to my sense, one of the fundamental issues um, with climate and and with justice, if I can if I can say that, is is scale. Um, that actually, so much of the injustice and so much of the ecological damage that we do and so much of the exploitation that that is a, a product of um, modern consumerist lifestyles comes from disconnection it comes from the sense that i have no relationship with the person who made those nike sneakers or um you know the person who's uh, who's grown the food that i eat and so the fact that they're massively exploited is something that i have to go out of my way to discover rather than something that's very obvious and i think it's um, on a on a smaller scale, um, such gross injustices don't tend to happen, and indeed, on a smaller scale, global scale environmental catastrophes don't tend to happen. Um, and so that's um, another of the really core elements, I think, in in David's work is his argument that um, it's inevitable, despite all the claims that globalization is the natural path of human evolution, actually. Um, relocalization is the inevitable 
path of, uh, of human evolution from here. And he has this, um, this wonderful quote, which uh, Rob Hopkins never, never tires of quoting, um, which is that localization stands at best at the limits of practical possibility, but it has the decisive argument in its favor that there will be no alternative. And, um, and that I think has massive implications, not just for um, ecological issues, but for, for justice issue, issues as well. And I'm aware that we're um, running short of time. Um, so I'd like to um, uh, play another clip from David and maybe read another section in less. I don't know, are there any, I'm getting a big thumbs up from Karen. I just wonder, are there any absolutely, I desperately want to ask this before Sean disappears things out in the room or um, shall I allow David to speak? I'm not seeing any waving hands. Oh, there's one there. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll hand over to you, Caroline, for a moment, and uh, just, they'll have to be quick because we're running short on time, but over to you. Uh, you're still muted, so I can't hear anything at your end. Yeah. Sorry. Hi. I'll try again. Okay. I don't think you really addressed the question of Paul Hawken and the two paradigms that Eric Utney brought up. Is there another over here? Hi. I'm Hank from Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I hear a lot of echoes of Michael Greer, and I wonder um, who impacted who the most, because Michael reads everything. Um, and, and so, um, just a few comment on that. Cool. Any, any one last thing? Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, quickly on Greer. Um, uh, John Michael Greer had never heard of David Fleming during his lifetime, but uh, Chelsea Green, the publishers of Lean Logic, sent him a copy, um, and his he he responded and gave us a blurb, which is actually on the back of um, on the back of Lean Logic. He described said this is a monumental achievement. David Fleming's Lean Logic is an encyclopedic guide to the crisis of industrial civilization. I challenge anyone to read as much of a page of it without finding at least one insight worth serious reflection. Um, conversely, uh, John Michael Greer's, um, one of his books, I believe, appears in the bibliography of um, Lean Logic. Um, I forget which one. Uh, the Long Descent. Um, which I think was published not that long before David Fleming passed away. Um, so I think it was, I think they were only peripherally aware of each other's work, but as you say, very much on the same page. Um, so I'm going to play this clip now and then come back to the, see whether there's anything more I can say about the Paul Hawken um, Clash of Paradigms issue. Mm. Right. The title, you, you, you see yourself as a, an economist with an environmental, or a, I don't know, you're, you're interested in... I'm an environmental economist, you could argue. I'm a thinker, but the thing is I do... Uh, 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 my speciality is being a generalist. Uh, my speciality is of going out, uh, it's being, it, in the academic world this is, this is called, it's an extremely long word, your, 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 your tape recorder will probably crash. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it, uh, um, interdisciplinary studies. That right. is, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I sort of try to. I sort of cover everything. There's almost nothing I don't sort of include in um, in in lean logic, which is why it's taken such a long time. So you're a holistic economist. Yes. Yes. Well, there's a lot of anthropological stuff actually, isn't there? Yes. In lean logic. So, 
which interests me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, and, it, and it could be taken to the cleanest, who knows, because they're, they're so, having to cover such a wide wide front, even with the even with the systems of Beth, it can be very difficult to to keep up with what's going on and all these things. And if I do keep up, every, I mean, the thing is, as I said, I get, I'm getting constant flack from friends and, and, and people, you know, so people what, pointing me in the street and saying, see that poor old fellow over there? Right. Yeah, that one. He's got big ideas. He's, 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 been writing this, <laughs> he's been writing this book for the last 20 years. He'll never finish it. <laughs> and then they say, he's a nice fellow, just don't mention the book. <laughs> Um, and actually, because I'm, uh, I'm just seeking a quote in Lean Logic, which I think addresses the Paul Hawking thing very gent directly, um, I'm going to play one more quick clip from David while I do that, which I was planning to end with. But um, uh, yeah, I will play it now. Government is still thinking about incentive schemes right. um, because they say that you know, people <coughs> they, they <coughs> people will that won't actually do anything unless they're, they're treated like donkeys, you know, with the carrot and the stick. Well, they actually we've got we are not donkeys, and if and we're treated like donkeys, then we'll behave like donkeys. If if we're if we're trusted, you know, to do something you know, which is actually which works, that is, say we want to do, then the thing is completely different. And lean logic is to a very large extent based on that. It's it's saying actually it's. It's treating human beings with respect to the people having mm. imagination, to use your word, and intelligence and judgment and motivation. And what we're doing is unleashing, the great unleashing that I'm interested in is unleashing the imagination mm. um, uh, of, of people so they can get on and build their own future, which I think is, I think a lot of people are prepared, are prepared to do. And the transition movement is an indication of how prepared they are. Um, yeah, so hopefully, yeah, so that was a little um, uh, bit of support from beyond the grave for all that, uh, for all that you're doing. Um, and uh, yeah, in terms of the, the Clash of Paradise thing, I mean, I feel like that's a whole, a whole workshop in itself, which I, I'd, I'd love to run right now, but we don't have time. Um, I mean, I suppose what I, I I've been quite surprised by, um, by the reception the books have got, actually, by how how positive it's been, how um, excited the reviewers have been, um, how many copies have been sold so far, um, it's been very gratifying because I, I didn't I didn't entirely expect that, um, and I, I think it's probably because of this, because um, in the same way that I was talking about. Um, this sort of third way, like not lifestyle change and not lobbying politicians, but getting together locally and acting. Um, I think maybe this is a kind of a third way rather than um, uh, between the sort of um, the techno utopia future that's being held out to us. I mean, in my in my transition timeline book back in 2009, I talked about um, the three dominant stories of our future um, that I think run through our culture in all sorts of forms. And one of those is business as usual that you know if um if the graph of whatever today has looked like that then the graph for the next 50 years will look like that um and you know that's a really powerful idea you know nothing really changes you know people talk big but everything just carries on um that's one of the ideas that really influences i think another idea is doom apocalypse of one kind or another whether it's um sort of environmental doom like films like the age of stupid or whether it's um you know terminator or whatever it may be that sense of or, or religious apocalypse, you know, all of these ideas are um, very powerful ones in our culture. Um, and then there's that techno utopia vision, um, you know, the, the Star Trek, you know, that our manifest destiny is to be off exploring the stars and human ingenuity will overcome all and gosh darn it, aren't we great. Um, and, you know, I think those three stories of the future um, influence all of us. I think all of us have those in us because they're in our they're in our media and they're in our plays and they're in our movies and they're in everything that we speak. So and, and I think we actually draw on all three of those at the same time when we kind of look to the future and we notice that um, as uh, as we look to the future our predictions tend to change depending on our mood and they tend to change between these three options. And I think what transition's really been about and what David Fleming's work is about 
um, has been what, what in that book I called the transition vision, which is much more about, um, it's really easy to see why um, the techno utopia vision is much more desirable than business as usual when we're all pretty miserable or apocalypse. So it's really easy to see why everyone says, yeah, yeah, I'll sign up for techno utopia. But the problem with that story is that it's not realistic. Um, it's a it's a pie in the sky story about this endless progress that has no limits and has no recognition of depletion or climate change or any of these things. Um, and the answer to the problem is always, oh, we'll solve it with technology later. You know, climate change. They're now saying, oh, well, actually, yeah, okay, we're not going to reduce emissions enough to stay under even three degrees, but it's okay because we'll suck it out later with technology. Which technology? Oh, we don't know, but we'll figure it out later. And the reason that's even remotely given any kind of credibility is because that story is so powerful, that techno-utopia story. It's like, well, obviously we'll suck it out later because we have to, because otherwise we won't get to Star Trek and that's where we're going. And, um, and so I think what's, what's powerful about um, David's work, which as I say, is this weird thing where David's work kind of birthed transition, but then transition is only now seeing David's work published. Um, but what's exciting about that vision that, that both transition and David's work are built on is that it's much more realistic it's the only realistic positive vision of the future that we have. Um, and unfortunately, at the moment, the market economy is fully invested in that techno-utopia vision. And um, as Eric was saying, you know, a lot of us draw on that. And I think Paul Hawkins' Project Drawdown, which I haven't read, so I don't want to say anything authoritative about it, but from what I've heard about it, it's very much drawing on that, um, uh, it's drawing on that vision of the future. Um, and yeah, really those are four, four stories of the future, four paradigms, and there is a real clash here. And I think we need to be very upfront about the fact that the techno visions are not realistic. And despite how much money is spent on marketing them and showing them and them being inevitable, and that's obviously where we're headed, there's a whole lot of hard science that says that path doesn't lead where it says it's leading. It says come to Star Trek and it leads to scorched earth, and that is not a path that we want to be walking. And so let's, you know, let's carry on walking the transition path. Let's build the better future one day at a time. Let's enjoy ourselves. Let's rediscover how to build Slack into our day-to-day -day lives. And for the person who um, was asking why this book is worth reading, hopefully you've now got some idea. Because for me, it's the most grounded, compelling vision of um, the path that transition is walking and the path that transition is walking in my eyes better than anyone else on the planet apart from the very few people who never forgot how to live convivially in the first place and didn't get sucked into the market economy but that's that's another workshop again so um so thank you very much all for coming to this workshop for being here instead of all the other fascinating places you could have been it's been an absolute pleasure i'll hand back to you for some last words and i'll stop wasting your time because you'll probably do some food or something i would imagine Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, this has been really, really great. And uh, really appreciate you taking your time to uh, talk with us across the, the, the ocean. And look forward to your next writings. And just look forward to seeing you again as well. So lots of love and appreciation from all of us here at Transition US National Conference. <laughs> Go team transition. <laughs> and by the way, I'd just say finally that um, uh, if you want more information on the, the book, um, the reviews, the video, me and Rob talking about the book, all that stuff, um, tinyurl.com slash leanlogic. Um, you'll find everything you could ever want to know about both the books, the paperback and the hard book, tinyurl.com slash leanlogic. And I'm darkoptimism.org or darkoptimism on Twitter. So um, I look forward to uh, hopefully chatting with some of you in person in the future. Bye then. <laughs>